Welcome to the Bike Radar Podcast, brought to you by the team behind BikeRadar.com, Cycling Plus and MBUK magazines. If you enjoy this episode, please subscribe. And if you can do so, leave us a rating on your podcast provider of choice. It really helps us reach other cyclists like you. Hello and welcome to the Bike Radar Podcast. My name's Alex Evans and I'm one of Bike Radar's senior technical editors. And today I'm in Schweinfurt in Germany at SRAM's European headquarters. I'm lucky enough to be joined by Andreas Kolsch, who's a mountain bike drivetrain product manager here at SRAM. And today we're going to be talking about SRAM's newest release, their all new T-Type Eagle drivetrain. Now SRAM has certainly ripped up the drivetrain and derailleur rulebook and redesigned the whole system to mount directly to the bike. This removes the need for a derailleur hanger and setup adjustments like the B-tension and limit screws. So without further ado, Andreas, let's talk about the new drivetrain and rewind all the way back to the beginning. When did the development start and what were the first steps? Yeah, hey Alex. First, welcome to Schweinfurt. Happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, this is actually, when you open the door here, you hear the heartbeat of our manufacturing power or actually the engineering power. Um, we have, just to add some background uh, globally on this new Eagle transmission, about 200 people involved in the actual development and half of them are sitting here in Schweinfurt. That's why we picked this place here uh, to talk about all the inventions that we brought into this new uh, transmission. So Schweinfurt is the home of drivetrain? Basically it's the home of mountain bike drivetrain and it has been ever since. Okay. Yeah. Cool. When we, back in the days, you know, at 1999 when SRAM acquired Sachs, we brought the first uh, shifting technology, external drivetrain technology in-house. Uh, we also got the chain competence to SRAM and this was all happening here. Not in this facility, but uh, on the other side of the street, on the other side of the river, but it all happened here in Schweinfurt. Cool, amazing, yeah. So there's a real history here. There is absolutely some history. Uh, actually, this this building, I mean, you, you can't see it right now, but this building was built as an IGH factory and we built uh, more than 40 million uh, inner gear hubs here. Yeah. And then at some point we decided we want to act in the market where we can be more uh, competitive and where we can bring more innovation in. And so we decided to focus 100% on mountain bike and road uh, drivetrain. And here we have our mountain bike drivetrain competence center. We are supported uh, for sure by um, other locations. Uh, one is Portugal, um, which is our chain factory. So we still manufacture all our chains in Europe. Mm -hmm. um, this was also an old uh, sex factory. Okay. And uh, then our crank and chain ring comes from Slow, mm -hmm. San Luis Obispo in California, yeah. where we had our uh, Truative acquisition. And then we have Spearfish for uh, quark power meters. Mm -hmm. And there's also a couple of things happening in Chicago, mainly on the electronics side. Okay, so there's quite a lot of moving parts, but, but yeah, yeah. here's like the, the here's, central. Here's the center. When when we came here to work every morning, we have calls to Taiwan to uh, do some factory process work and wow. stuff. And then midday, when Chicago wakes up, we uh, we talk we talk to them. And then walking around the globe, we, yeah. we finish the day talking to our brand managers in in Vancouver, uh, Canada, and uh, in in. Uh, San Luis Obispo in California to our uh, crank and chain ring engineers. Okay, and as as one of the drivetrain product managers, you know, I guess you're you're pretty involved in the whole process, right? What, like, what's your kind of job, and how how have you helped shape this whole process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I joined uh, SRAM ten years ago as a product specialist, and I was uh, lucky to be part of all the drivetrain history where SRAM really began uh, to make some changes and brought real innovation to the market. Think back of the time when we brought uh, 1x11 to the market, XX1, it was 
uh, disruptive and we anticipated to sell like 5,000 pieces and we were overwhelmed with the demand and had okay. to produce like almost 10 times oh, wow. what we anticipated. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, from there, uh, we continued our story of uh, eliminating barriers. And I, yeah, by the time I uh, was, I, I had my little van and were uh, um, equipped with tools and, and drivetrains and uh, drove out all over Europe and equipped bikes with one by drivetrains and convinced people to to drive uh, to ride one by on their on their bikes and yeah of course there was still uh, uh, some things missing um, a little bit of range maybe some some gears weren't right and so we made this evolution to Ego which was um, a game changer for the market um, lots of price points uh, many use cases. Um, super successful in winning basically all relevant mountain bike races. And yeah, with that, uh, uh, we yeah we, we we built on that. We built on Eagle and uh, brought uh, Access Technology in. And this is basically uh, right after that I became a product manager and uh, took over uh, the job from my previous uh, colleagues. And then we were challenged. Okay, what's coming next? I mean. The market is expecting something from yeah. from SRAM, and we know that it's n it's not the end. We we just basically removed the obvious things on a on a mountain bike drive train. It's like why do you need a front derailleur? Why do you need cables? Why do you need uh, sloppy chain and all these things? Um, but there is way more that we can do. We have uh, the fastest, most precise shifting with access technology, and yeah. Again, I mean, these were just obvious things, but then we thought about, okay, what, what can we do next? And I think most obvious is that uh, we want to like really go deep into what the rider needs, what's important on the trail. And so we basically identified uh, three uh, major things. Uh, one is that we want to have this thing super robust and reliable. Uh, there is still many people out there uh, for them the entrance to access is a barrier just due to the price point which is totally fair like why why should you spend like a huge amount of your m monthly income on a derailleur uh, that you might uh, crash on the on the next berm on the next ride um, and so robustness and reliability was a big one for us um, the next one is that we just wanted to generally uh, make things easier, simpler, um, easier to maintain, easier to handle throughout the whole lifetime, like starting in bike assembly for the big factories who are actually assembling the bikes, then the dealer, and then uh, the rider at home in the garage when they're working on the bike, and then of course also on the trail. And last but not least, uh, by the time uh, e-bikes were a thing, I was trying to say became a thing, but they this were a, a few thing. years ago yeah. when you were doing all this, right? They were a thing, and it was clear that we need to do something that is uh, uh, perfectly set up to be able to shift under load. So these are the major things, robust and reliable, perfect shifting under load, as well as um, the ease of use. Okay. So, uh, the, so the, 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 they're like your, your pillars of, of what you wanted and they came before you thought about the, pro the product in any way? Um, it's, it's usually a parallel uh, development of like ideas that come from product management and also things that are around in advanced development. So we have uh, um, quite a large group of people working on just new things. So they are inventors and they can do whatever they want and whatever they think makes make, make bikes better. And so we, yeah, we, we come together uh, regularly and we present our things. And then like once, once the pile is big enough with new inventory, say, okay, this combined with this and this and this could be a thing. Okay. So you, you and, kind of take your picks. You have all of these crazy ideas that these guys have been working on. Exactly. And, and I you mean, see there's an element yeah. of one thing from this and then another, and you pick them. Absolutely. I mean, 
everyone here is a is a rider uh, mountain bikers commuters like everyone here rides and uh, of course everyone wants to make those things better and more reliable so it was kind of obvious for everyone to to go that next next steps um, and yeah i mean this was kind of a surprise that he came to us and say oh we have a derailleur but we have to mount it from two sides of the of the bicycle and uh, we need a hole in the bicycle and we basically need to change all the frames of the world and we were like whoa okay that's uh, kind of a challenge and uh, you know everyone out there uh, hates change yeah. like uh, talking just just uh, saying the word uh, new standard is yeah. makes everyone crazy and we're like okay how can we address this and so the idea uh, of the universal derailleur here uh, came up uh, which is uh, a great idea on its own i think uh, it uh, takes a lot of stress from the bike manufacturers to uh, to engineer derailleur hangers um, but it's also a huge value for every rider out there like you have your maybe your specific bike and you go to a once in a lifetime trip to Whistler bike park and yeah it will happen that you touch a rock there and yeah what then if yeah. you have like a Germanic bike brand or whatever yeah. it's it takes three weeks until you get your uh, derailleur hanger spare but wouldn't it be nice to just walk down uh, to, to Whistler village and just go to any bike shop and they of course we have a uni university derailleur hanger and you put it back on your bike um, and you're ready to to enjoy your once in a lifetime trip. So it's like a seemingly uh, insurmountable task of persuading bike manufacturers to adopt your system. Yeah. Actually, when you kind of present the facts, it's maybe not so crazy, right? Yeah, it's not so crazy. I mean, we have been approached by many bike manufacturers before and they ask us, how can we make this better? How can we, what can we do as a bike manufacturer to give you a better interface for for your um, drivetrain and we say okay we have to get rid of 25,000 different uh, derailleur yeah. hangers because <laughs> this is the only reason why we have all the screws on the on the derailleur the limit screws the outer and the inner limit screw as well as the b gap screw they only exist because we have so many different variants of derailleur hangers. Yeah, partly it was uh, easy to get out there and say, hey, we have a universal derailleur hanger. And they were like, okay, cool. We don't have to engineer it anymore. Um, SRAM takes over the distribution, um, but it's also an open uh, an open concept or an, I don't know how to. So a, a, a third party could can absolutely do it. You can yeah. uh, download um, a free license uh, from from SRAM, and uh, everyone can do it basically. So we we didn't say you have to buy it from SRAM and only from us. Um, but for many people, it just made things easier. Mm -hmm. But then there were, of course, also other um, involved, where like. Um, the derailleur hanger was a big part of their frame design uh, where it wasn't so easy to like okay we, here's a new concept they're like oh we just changed last year all our platforms to a new version so we had to teaser a little bit what's coming and then it was an easy game but this started in the early year of 2018 okay. which is uh, yeah so by the well, time five years ago five, now. five years ago yeah. um, long time ago and yeah now you can go out and you basically every bike that is new launched has a university radar hanger on mm. and uh, uh, obviously we had the, the right arguments and uh, showed the right people the right things early enough so that we could uh, get this done and it's not again it's not a downside you can still put on any bike a university derailleur hanger and any conservative drivetrain of any uh, drivetrain manufacturer and you're you're good to go yeah and uh, yeah, it has some advantages it can rotate backwards it has the derailment or re-railment feature and so there are a couple of good things on the university derailleur. so it was was good on its own and then yeah there were some too smart people out there of course they're walking through patents all the time it's like oh there's interesting concepts coming from SRAM I mean that's always the risk if you work on new stuff that you uh, at some point you have to file a patent and then after uh, 
a couple of years they were published and then people can see it but that's fine and uh, that even gave us another boost mm -hmm. on the uh, on the market to push the university railer hanger concept through for those maybe smaller brands that we couldn't reach uh, in the first way for uh, that maybe haven't heard about the university railer hanger uh, at all and then they got it okay university railer hanger and those patents are there there's maybe something coming because I, I guess the aim is to have every bike brand that makes you know like mid to high level bikes i guess is is, is what this is currently aimed at absolutely we we believe 100 percent in this new full mount concept and uh, i think it, it makes bikes way better and we want to give that opportunity to every rider out there that they can uh, ride our our new concept that makes the the life of a rider rider so much easier and uh, yeah not not just mid and high level bikes uh, i would even go down to like a 999 hardtail okay even there a full mount attachment could be a big thing okay is that potentially a hint for some future uh so i mean yeah hint yeah. or I, I mean ho hopefully automatically people would say okay yeah that's a big value if i can yeah uh jump on my bike and crash in a berm and uh, people might have seen the crash of nino shorter in the um 2022 uh, World Championship race in Léger. Like he was crashing in lap two or three, sliding 15 meters down the slope uh, on the derailleur side, and he hopped back on the bike and uh, won the World Championship title. Which is a dream come true for you guys, right? Absolutely in, in, dream in come true. Ways, yeah. yeah, and yeah. Uh, like this could not have been possible with our uh, classic mount uh, derailleur hanger. Like by the time the derailleur hanger were absolutely Bent, and Nino would have gone back to the to the pits and got the minimum the derailleur hanger exchanged, maybe even the the, the RD, and uh, no chance to get uh, a world uh, championship on that ride. But he did it because he had a super robust and reliable drivetrain. And yeah, I think that's an, it's a very important fact. Of course, it makes things maybe a little bit more beefier and so a little bit heavier, but it adds security for the people that make their living with mountain bike riding, but also for people that spend most of their money that they have available on, on mountain bikes just because they enjoy mountain bike riding. And uh, we want to make sure that they have, that they get the most out of it. And this is basically also what we looked at. And uh, yeah, of course, we, we gain a lot of data with our uh, global uh, SRAM technical service and our tech centers in basically every country uh, where we see also just from data what, what can happen to a drivetrain. And there are almost 200 uh, root causes for uh, uh, a failure for a drivetrain that makes me saying my drivetrain is not working. It can be anything. It can be just a minor thing, can be uh, a snap chain, of course. <laughs> and so we looked into this and uh, said, okay, what's what's most, uh, most important for that? And uh, most of those things were actually uh, that uh, they were caused by um, a, a bent derailleur hanger okay. and the next big one is um, a wrong adjustment yeah and i i uh, always also bring up the analogy of uh, like a big bike festival let's pick whistler sea otter lake garda or uh, any of those bigger uh, rider events, uh, there is the SRAM truck and uh, imagine you have 100 people waiting in front of the truck to get service and they're complaining my drivetrain is not working. So let's take rock shocks and brakes and all these things out for a second. Just 100 people in front of the truck wanted to service their drivetrain and usually 50% of them are just a non-straight derailleur hanger. So with this new concept, 50% of all these issues basically were solved. And then from the remaining 50 people in, in, in the line in front of uh, the truck, there's probably another 50%, so 25 or even more that have just a wrong adjustment. 
wrong B gap, wrong limit screw, maybe wrong cable tension. And uh, this could be also solved with a concept that doesn't have any screws or any things that you have to adjust. And so like, okay, if we can solve 50, uh, sorry, 75% of all root causes that lead into a drive then that is not properly working anymore, wouldn't that be great? Yeah. Yeah. And so it was absolutely clear for us to do this. Luckily, we came up with the idea of the university railway hanger. We brought it to the market. We made all the bikes ready by the time we have 250, 300 models out there that have a uh, university railer hanger. So on the aftermarket side, if you have bought a bike within the last two or three years, it's very likely that you have a, already a university railer hanger on. And for every bike that you buy new, you definitely will have a university railer hanger on. So um, it was a big effort to get this done without talking about the future, yeah. but uh, luckily, luckily, away, luckily it worked future. out. And uh, yeah, uh, yeah thanks, for, thanks to all the manufacturers that committed right away and gave us the trust to, um, to bring something new that really makes bike, bikes better. Hmm. So and that's like really interesting because you kind of got like, You've, you've given your reasons, you've got the what, you've got the how, and you've got the kind of the why, you know, and it's all kind of bundled together, right? It's, they're kind of not isolated. All of those things seem to be coming together to... to Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic hit in and then everything got screwed up, okay. uh, screwed up and uh, we were actually ready uh, way earlier. Oh, wow. why, why would you... Yeah. Uh, bring a new uh, product to the market if frames are not available or if the <laughs> demand or if shops are sold out for the next one and a half years anyway. So we had to time this a little bit better. Okay. But this also gave us some time to make the portfolio even better and add maybe even more things that we didn't have in the scope right away. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, that's cool stuff. I mean, I, I just want to, to highlight one more thing. Like we were talking about these robustness, reliability, better shifting, all these things, they kind of sound obvious too. But unfortunately, back in the days, it was, or not back in the days, but within the last 10 years, it was still like, okay, we want lighter drive cranes, we want more range, we want more gears, and it was kind of a battle to make things uh, just uh, better by adding gears or adding range or reducing the weight. And I think uh, maybe also right timing, what was happening on the cross country racing side that you see, okay, they don't need bikes anymore that are less than 10 kilos. Mm -hmm. They have now mostly full suspension. They sometimes ride a dropper post. They put bigger brakes on to add safety to make the uh, the ride uh, better, safer to actually uh, win the race. And uh, so I think, uh, yeah, things came together and that also helped us to convince people, hey, maybe we have to think a little bit different, do some changes on the frame, add some material here and there, but the outcome, the end product will be way better. And uh, so far, we haven't had any discussions about, oh, why is this not lighter? Why is this not uh, um, more gears, more range? Of course, there were some discussions here and there where some brands, product managers said, uh, you know, you would help me a lot if you do like 13 speed, 14 speed or whatever, or something different. Um, in order but, to sell more yeah. bikes, in it, to, as but like we a, said, a marketing uh, thing. Yeah, absolutely, but uh, we said, okay, but at the end of the day, the power has the rider the rider has the cash and the rider is the most important thing of our industry like the industry wouldn't exist without the rider so we need to 100 percent focus on the rider needs what what is needed on the trail and what makes uh, people on the trail happier to make the bike ride more enjoyable and i think uh, at least for me it was more important to focus on these things than just the obvious things when you like put a derailleur on the scale and like, oh, this is 85 grams heavier than the older version, like, okay. And so you compare two derailleurs, but it's two different concepts and mm -hmm. the value behind it is com completely different. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. And like, uh, so 
I, and you, you've kind of done this in like um, the, the way you've done all this I guess is that the, the, for people that don't know that haven't seen this and are maybe new to it that the derailleur mounts directly to the frame right so yeah, exactly we have a coaxial mount of the derailleur it basically rotates around the axle and it grabs the frame from two sides it's kind of a sandwich interface that we call full mount that gives us a super robust um, interface and the coaxial adjustment allows us with a coaxial rotation around the uh, axle that uh, the b gap basically is in any position of the uh, derailleur independent of the chain length always in the same uh, position because with a with a derailleur hanger you've obviously offset the the central position of the derailleur from the axle correct so when you turn it around the cassette correct. it's in a different place correct yeah okay and, and then and then you, you've managed to eliminate the adjustment screws because and you know i guess that this is a real long game from from your guys's part right with the udh and the xd driver which uh, now suddenly created a really specific space that the derailleur operates in. Correct, so basically the frame doesn't play a role anymore, which was the biggest factor for tolerances that were brought into the system that we had to compensate. So it's totally fine that all bike concepts are different and there are different concepts and philosophies behind uh, uh, every a single bike and also in between the different bike manufacturers um, but they added a lot of complexity that we had to compensate with all our screws and all our designs like all the the linkage the uh, the cage design the pulley size all these things were there to compensate the different frame designs and they don't play a role anymore so the derailleur inside basically is uh, touching directly to the end cap of the hub, um, so the frame is not a is not a problem anymore. And uh, we bring those two things together that need to come together, right? I mean, it's again something that's super obvious. If you want to have the perfect shifting, you need to have a derailleur and a cassette working perfectly together. And so, in the past, there was in between the cassette there was. Uh, uh, frame, then a derailleur hanger, and then the derailleur, and now we have the derailleur directly and next to the cassette. That gave us also a little bit more space, so that we were able to move the cassette a little bit further out by 2.5 millimeters, that, so this new system results in a 55 millimeter chain line, also more frame clearance on the, on the front, front chain ring for better kinematics and suspension and other frame designs. So there were a couple of things that came together. Okay. So I guess, uh, you know, the kind of one of the obvious questions to me at least is that you had the ability to start from afresh with the UDH. Why did you guys not choose to do something like put the derailleur on top of the cassette or behind it, for example? And then what you'd be able to do is get, get rid of people saying, oh my God, the derailleur is in the way of rocks the ground. We, we have all concepts in our drawers and there's always discussions about several things and there's super interesting things that we saw recently coming from, from Canada and... Uh, where they, so just for people listening, that's where they basically dismantled the derailleur and, and moved it, right? Uh, absolutely, and those things are always exciting, but it's uh, on a mountain bike drivetrain you still find to you still need to find the right balance out of multiple things uh, i try to avoid the word compromise because uh, we want to deliver the best solution as a the out balancing all these things and usually you always come back to an external drivetrain as the the best solution and um, yeah it would have been too much of an effort to get even more things changed and that's an even more and even bigger uh, impact to the to the frame design okay it is possible but it also adding complexity in in some way um not talking uh, in, in about this concept in particular uh, which is great but uh, like in general other concepts uh, belts and gearboxes and all these things and so 
the approach was to make things easier and to bring another evolution into our history of eliminating, eliminating barriers. And so we relatively fast decided that any other concept is not what we want to do okay. for, for now. And uh, yeah, we always have things like I, like I mentioned, we, we, we know about all these things. We have all these concepts in, in our drawers, but at the end of the day, it has to be uh, affordable for sure for the writer. Um, and we also want to to scale it down right so there we need concept that are light and built to make the next world champion on a cross-country bike or the next ews champion on an enduro bike but we also want to make the all-day rider happy that like not like us we can we can ride every day as long as we want but there are people that they call themselves mountain bikers and it's their hobby, but they only have time to ride once or twice a month. And that's a lot sometimes. And so um, it's it's totally fair that they only have uh, a limited bad budget, but they need uh, uh, a good solution too. And when we look at those other concepts, they are not so easy to trickle down, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. right? So. Uh, they're sometimes super exciting, but what can you do in a, on a gearbox to differentiate different uh, price points? It's, there's not much that you can do in terms of different ways of, to, to manufacture or different materials that you can yeah, use. Yeah, okay. So your gearbox is pretty set in terms of what it needs to do. Yeah, I mean, look at, look at motors on e-bikes. Like, yeah. um, from us, it, it's expected that we have like a drivetrain for like the, the top of the line and then we have five price points down like in between SX and XX1 there's a huge gap but when you look at a motor manufacturer and ask them for like wh where are your different price points like we can only do this yeah what, what should we do to make something different and this is basically the same when you talk about gearboxes or other solutions that are hard to to trigger down and get everyone on on both sides of the spectrum of mountain bikers uh, the chance to participate in the, in this new technology. Hmm. Okay, yeah, great answer. <laughs> um, what what would you say to people that um, you know say our oh, derailleurs are inappropriate in terms of the, the location of them? Because um, I, I know you guys have worked really hard, and I, I've been fortunate enough to see all the testing, the lab testing that you've done here um, to to make this one stronger. And I know you personally jump on your bike. Uh, with the derailleur side down, um, you know, and you're, 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 you're what, two, nearly two meters tall? Big, big uh, yeah, I'm definitely uh, dressed up. I'm more than 100 kilos for sure. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just staying with this analogy, I we can put six people of my size on the bike before we see any plastic deformation on the derailleur. Um, but those are scenarios that can happen every day when you're traveling with your bike, when you put like in your tiny garage where you have to store two mountain bikes and the kids' bikes and the other things. Like there's always things that can happen to your drivetrain or e-bikes. They're super heavy. They can fall on the side and this is just happening. You, you hit rocks uh, on the trail or locks or whatever. And uh, yeah, uh, robustness is super uh, important yeah because I mean the, you know the, the new system I mean everything that I saw seen here it actually shows that it's you know it's pretty damn resistant to yeah so your your question was what is it still uh, very exposed of course it's, it's very exposed but the brake lever is also exposed and there are a couple of other things the bottle cage there's there's so many things that can easily break when you just hit it in the right location um, of course the uh, derailleur is very close to the trail um, and very close to the rocks that are uh, on the ground. Uh, and therefore, we, uh, of course, try to make this uh, as use case or most suitable for like a real mountain bike ride. So the new system sits almost a centimeter further inboard comparing to um, current. So it's really hard if you really try hard to push something with a derailleur, it's hard. Um, even with a regular system that sits out even further. Because you, if you're hitting the derailleur, you, you're probably pretty close to hitting your fork lowers 
at the dropout and also your pedal cranks pedals cranks up. right yeah. um but of course it can happen you can slip off a like a a tiny wooden bridge on a yeah. Canadian <laughs> offshore trail. If you slip off that thing on the on the left side, you can easily hit the derailleur, and so it can happen to rocks and, and other things. Uh, but we move this uh, in; it can still rotate backwards, and there is the the clutch uh, implemented and the RD. So if we hit something, it automatically readjusts due to the access system that's possible, and. Um, yeah, there are a couple of other things that are uh, hard to explain here, but the magic pulley and also the rejection of little sticks in between uh, chain and chain rings. Uh, the same for the chain ring on the front. We have now the guards that you can bolt on or you take off right foot front, left foot front, up to your personal preferences that add just extra security, extra protection, extra robustness for chain and chain ring to make an external drivetrain, even if it's its external, um, uh, even better. And basically, the, I guess you, your hope, and I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it kind of feels like that the, the rider's almost the limit now. If you're, you know, in a position where you're breaking these components, it's probably because you've had a massive crash, and you're not going to be in the best situation yourself anyway. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we of course we always try. And unfortunately, view from the drivetrain side, we cannot avoid uh, a, a crash. Uh, but if it's happened, it happens, and it's part of our uh, sport. And maybe that's even why we like it. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the tiny bit of a risk that's always there. Uh, but it, it it can happen. But that's why we're calling it transmission, right? Because it's like it's almost the the best external gearbox, if you will, that was ever delivered um, as cassette and derailleur working so close together. Um, the only thing that is missing is just a box that we put around it, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so um, it, it gets really robust, really reliable and uh, easy to service, easy to set up, virtually no adjustment needed and uh, it makes things so much easier. And also what we haven't talked about bringing uh, derailleur and cassette so close together gave us uh, a whole bunch of opportunities to also improve the shift design. Mm -hmm. As uh, in addition to uh, uh, an all new uh, cassette design with a full X sync on basically every uh, cock of the cassette. So we do exactly know in what position the chain is on the cassette to guide them in the right, right shifting lanes for a perfect super controlled shift. And this is also only possible because we have this new groundbreaking um, design. Yeah, and, and the, the shifting, you know, is, is genuinely impressive. I've been lucky enough to to have the bike, and I'm, you know, I've been riding it, and yeah, you, you know, actually, you guys are, are right. You're, you're not, um, you know, it's not just marketing, uh, you know, talk from yeah. personal experience. So it's. Would you agree if we say the harder you pedal, the better it shifts? Yeah, it feels yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's genuinely impressive. And yeah. it's, I mean, it's a big. In the beginning, I said people. Uh, love change, but they hate to be changed. Um, uh, this is a, a tough one. I guess it took a while for you to figure that out. But once you are used to it, that you can now shift in any situation and don't want, don't need to wait until you have put your load out of your legs and then actuate the shift and then at some point start pedaling again. Uh, it's kind of a new behavior that you need to learn on a mountain bike but once you're used to it it's just a game changer and you don't want to go back and if you go back you realize immediately like oh shit this is <laughs> so clunky so loud and uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that this is, an, this is a new standard yeah there you go you've yeah. done it yeah, <laughs> yeah amazing um, I, I don't know if there's really much else to add I guess the only thing that people always want to know about is is what's next you know what what's in the future and you kind of hinted earlier that you know maybe this technology will make it way, its way to more affordable um, areas yeah so with this we brought uh, uh, access to a all new level and we want to bring access to even more people and uh, because yeah we think that's that's a big value it makes things easier um, through the line again from the assembly dealer uh, at home in the workshop on the trail 
And so I'm also convinced that the full mount attachment um, is the future and we want to bring this advantage uh, to everyone. Like I even see kids bikes at some point equipped with this where it makes even more sense, mm -hmm. right? When you look at the kids, they yeah. chuck their bikes <laughs> on the floor, whatever, yeah, yeah. And so yeah. Uh, Stay tuned for more, and uh, uh, I think it's it's pretty exciting. Great. Well, thank you so much, Andreas. That's really Welcome. you know really interesting stuff, and you know I appreciate you you taking the time to to talk to us. Absolutely, my pleasure. You're welcome. Great. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Thanks for listening to the Bike Radar Podcast. If you've not done so already, please subscribe and share with your friends or leave us a rating if you've enjoyed this episode. 